Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Carl Herberger at Radware. I am very pleased to be here. I'm from the U.S., as I think you can tell. I run globally the security business for Radware for the last nine years. I've been a CISO in a couple of different big businesses. I've also run a business for a while, and uh, I have been in the military, as I told you. I'm here to talk to you about automation, and I know that there's a lot of talk about automation, and I imagine that most of you have some sort of form or function where you're driven towards an automation project. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of press that suggests that uh, in the future, automation will result in uh, you, you, a human, not being able to apply for a job, a job to drive a bus, a job to make food, maybe even a job to be a security engineer. <coughs> but really, what I'm here to talk about isn't the ethos around automation. It's what your job is today as it participates in the securing of automation. I'm going to introduce to you five core broad topics that are fundamentally key to security, and it fundamentally resolves around what you're doing in automation. Some of this may not be so new to you, some of it might be, uh, but it's right here in the forefront. If you're not familiar with these two accidents, it's an automation discussion. The whole discussion on these accidents is around the threat to automation. And realistically, you're responsible for it. <laughs> what I mean by that is that how many of you consider yourselves geeks or engineers of some sort? Many of you do, I do. How many of you have kids? A lot. All right, so I'm going to tie this in at the end. I want you to think in your head, if you had your kids today, let's say that they're 12, something like this, and you're, gonna, you're going to counsel them on what are the future jobs and job titles for them to go after in the future. I'll give you four or five that probably don't even exist today at the end of this presentation. But mostly, our world does this, right? Our world of engineering. We decide that there's been a problem, we stop, we think about the problem, we engineering a solution around it, and we automate it. And that actually leads to more and more automation. And the removal of the people who make fun of us for calling us geeks and automation engineers and so forth, right? The, the paradoxically, at the same time that there's a lot of automation going on in the world, at the same time, the world's threat landscape, don't take my words, take Davos. It's been really interesting if you've actually been, been watching the Davos year on, year out list of total risks to the world, whether or not you believe it or not. There are now three that are considered extremely high risk that are in the world of information security. This is a business language, not a security language, not a technology language. They say cyber attacks. These are the things that can take you down. Data theft, which they see as separate as cyber attacks, and, infra and infrastructural attacks, which somehow they separate from cyber attacks. Right? What do those things look like in the future? Let's see if I got this. Uh, I just, I think I'm going the wrong way. This is the automation piece. All right, I'll give you a preview. So the, if you're not familiar with the automation, let's see, click, okay. <laughs> with the automation world, you're probably familiar with OWASP. If you're not familiar with OWASP, you're probably a layer three or layer four guy, a network guy or person. OWASP has been around for a long time, the Open Web Appli Application Security Project. And most, the celebrity project from OWASP is the web application security list, which has been notoriously made celebrity status by PCI compliance, saying that the top 10 threats have to be complied with for a web application. However, they have two other projects. One is to detail every threat that is actually promulgated in an automated way. In other words, a non-human-oriented threat 
a vector that is hard to deal with, except if you're dealing with automation yourself, that you're actually defending with automation. It's called the top 21 automated threats. There's another project for mobile threats, and these are separate. So I want to show you how these look in the real world to Hollywood. You guys familiar with this movie? Anybody? Fast and Furious, right. You see how the cars are no longer controlled by the operators. They're totally controlled by a central control authority. That they're misdirected and redirected. This is how Hollywood sees the threat, right? This is the kind of way to think about the problem. This isn't that far off from the 737 accident, actually, if you think about this. How would this get done technically? How would you do this? Actually, stuff like this has been done, not at scale, but in onesies, twosies, they proved this out in Black Hat, that you can do things like this. This is done through a combination of automated threats through one of these five categories, most notably the first. I'll talk about five categories which I really want you to spend the time with as you leave this conference, if you haven't already, to deal with. One is the, the threats associated with APIs. I'm going to foot stomp this one very, very hard because I believe that very few people really understand this threat. I think very few people, even if they understand it, know what to do about it. And third, I think the funding and the technology to address it is actually not so good yet. In addition, many people tell you that the API threat is the number one problem going forward. Threat number two are watering holes. It's a whole other mo mental model that changes the way you think about how you're going to be attacked or are being attacked. Third is bots. Automated threat in action is a bot. Automation, non-human, threats are bots. So we'll talk about that. I'm going to talk about something that's very paradoxical. Automated humans. Social engineering, we all know, is one of the most effective vectors in security. And the ability to automate social engineering, which is a very big oxymoron, the two words don't go together, automate social engineering, is the future. And I'll show you that. And then AI. There's a lot placed on AI. There's a lot of conversations on AI. But I'm going to spend on something that you probably haven't thought much about. This is an area that I think very few people are thinking about. It's how to protect your AI. And I'm telling you that if you don't start working on that today, your machine learning, your deep learning, your algorithms and so forth, you're going to have a very big issue trying to use your AI against the bad guys. All right, so APIs. What's the problem with APIs? First, the relevance in APIs. I don't know if you realize this or not, but 62% of the internet is run via API. The calls measured by HTTP connections on the internet is fundamentally APIs. If you take any one of the big companies, Amazon, Facebook, eBay, YouTube, PayPal, their, their platforms that are actually worth something are not their .coms, it's their APIs. It's their .apis or api.ebay, api.paypal, and so forth, right? And the controls that you normally use for HTTP, like web application firewalls, generally very poor, if at all, protections on APIs or API gateways. In addition to mobile apps, so APIs, a gateway, is, a, is another way to do HTTP. It's something different than web applications, and it causes the ability for you to have total access into your environment, and I'll show you that. So how does it work? When you become unavailable, like what happened with Facebook just a couple of days ago, or happens to Xbox every week, <laughs> as far as my kids are concerned, how does it normally work? Well, actually, the way that the API world works is that there's an economy. Uh, I just did this again. I get to give you previews in my presentation. So um, 
and that there's an economy. Normally, there's a gateway to an API, and, that, and then there's back-end API calls. Many of us probably already understand this API economy. They, we probably already fundamentally get how one call is made to the other, and it causes and spawns another service. It goes to a third party ad ag agency or to a reviewer or something like this. What I don't think we understand is the ability for that wedding cake, that deck of cards, to become an amazing threat complex for us, that you just need one piece of that card, one piece of that API gateway, to actually make the whole problem set go away or come down or be unavailable. So what you see here is a situation where you can have middle tier services and back end services, third party services that can infect your environment. I'm not saying this as if it hasn't happened. It happens almost weekly now. This is a big part of the problem that happened at British Airways with their attack. So the API gateways are being used for what? Well, actually, it is the language between cloud computing and virtual servers. For every use case to be able to orchestrate and automate, the language that is used is JSON. Yeah, XML is the old language, but JSON is the future language, it's the language. JSON is what's used in almost all API gateways today and fundamentally used for DevOps, for all SDN applications, and for fog computing. In fact, as a vendor, that our tools are being asked more and more, don't even bother giving me a visibility platform. I just want APIs. Expose everything, give me everything. Expose in an API. That's what the requests are coming in from the IT communities. And these are the major use cases. So how does it work? Well, the truth is, is that the different vulnerabilities, and here are just a few to API gateways, and APIs in general, the different vulnerabilities allow for a single place, a single place for failure, and a massive blast radius, right? This is how a lot of availability problems actually permeate themselves, is that you actually have one area, where, or for that matter, malware infects you, ransomware infects you, crypto mining happens, and so forth, is through this ecosystem, or this API economy that becomes infiltrated. Don't ask me, just do a quick Google search on this if you haven't been following it. It's amazing how much the problem is right in front of us and how little we are actually talking about it, right? Nearly every day, there's some sort of API breach, massive security alert, massive problem in the news. Equifax, the world's, among one of the world's worst data leaks was explained by an API problem. Facebook's worst breach explained by an API problem. British Airways' worst breach explained by an API problem. Yeah, there were technical differences, but it was an API problem. Sometimes they were legal APIs. Sometimes they were illegal APIs. API problems nevertheless, right? So let's go through watering hole attacks. How many people think they know what a watering hole attack is before I go through it? Watering hole attacks are simple, really in concept. It's the idea that I'm not going to attack you. In fact, I don't even need to. Why? Because more and more today, you need to come to me. I don't need to go to you. It's not like it used to be where you had everything inside of your data center. Today, you're using a million third parties a million cloud services, a million things that I know you have to use, SSL certificates, DNS resolution, and so forth. You have to do things, whether or not you like it or not, and you have to go somewhere to become part of your business. That going somewhere is a great place to take you over. That's the watering hole, right? How do watering holes look? Click, click, click. There we go. Here's some examples of watering holes. One of the best watering holes that I love is security update services. Now, we offer security update services ourselves. Our web application firewall has weekly updates. Our DDoS tool has weekly updates if there's no security violations or some out-of-band updates. 
every viral manufacturer has updates, every IPS manufacturer has updates. Let me ask you a serious question. Have you ever checked those updates for problems? That they didn't have code bad, bad code in it, bad problems? Is it because you think that that, that never happened? That that doesn't happen? Or that it's not a real risk? In Korea, a few years ago, the whole Korean banking system was taken down by their update services on a major Korean vendor being infiltrated by the North Koreans and putting in a nice package and being distributed through their whole antivirus system. It's a very efficient way to, to distribute malware through an update service. Do you see, you see that how this works? Certificates and certificate management, uh, app stores, code repositories. There's some great examples out there on JSON today where there's code out there that embedded in the open source code is malware. And people go in your DevOps environments, do exactly what every coder does these days, copy, paste, copy, paste, right? And just puts it into their system. This is how you get a lot of infections in your environment, watering hole attacks. Don't take my words for it, check them out. There is a lot of backdoors in popular JavaScript libraries. A lot of backdoors in Python. Huge vulnerabilities in this environment. Why don't we know about it as much as we know about some of the other things? Because we're not actually evaluating these things as they're being pulled down through the web browser on copy-paste scripts and then put into our systems, right? What's another proxy? Another watering hole. Alexa. Siri, Cortana, chatbots, right? All of these are doing what? They are taking your commands and then going finding out what you're trying to ask it to do. It's a proxy. Anytime you have a proxy, you have the opportunity for a watering hole, right? Because living on that proxy has the ability for you to actually give it information that you're unwill unwittingly giving somebody that might have infiltrated that proxy. And Alexa is a service. We don't know what Alexa's security models are or not, right? And you have to think about this as you implement these things as you go forward. This is a major piece, uh, a major problem as we go forward. Side channel attacks. It's another form of watering hole. It's supposed to be populated here. There we go. Side channel attacks are the idea that I'm going to attack your, your main uh, fulfillment partners. In airlines, this would be something like attacking the ticketing pricing agencies that actually they get their fulfillment on. It could be actually attacking their a way in which they get clearances for the aircraft. This happened in Poland. There was a DDoS attack on the clearance engine, and none of, none of the lot airlines was able to actually get a clearance, so the airline couldn't actually run that day. That's a side channel attack. All right, bots. Tell me if you know this movie. It's an older movie. What is it? Yep, I, Robot. I like Will Smith because he's from my hometown, Philadelphia. Um, if you're not familiar with this, and really, the, the, it's kind of like settled science here that the internet now is made up of roughly 50-50 bots and humans. Depending on who numbers you look at, it's 40, 60, 70, 30, uh, and so forth. I think it's pretty settled that at the moment it's 50-50. What does that mean? It means that the old security problem where you were trying to find the bad guy or girl has been, it has been multiplied because now you're trying to also find the bad bot or bad bot girl, <laughs> I guess. What you're so you first have to know, is it human, is it not? Is it bot, is it not? Is it good, is it not? Right. So it's, a, it's almost like a linear regression model as you move forward. It turns out that of the bots, ha roughly half of them are bad and half of them are good. Can you distinguish today on your website how many bots you have, where are they going, what's the percentage on the web path that are bots, how many of them are good, how many of them are suspect, how many of them are known bad. 
These are the things that are super important as you move forward, especially in the world of automation. This is actually how you attack automation. In the world of bots, there's two types. There's HTTP, as I mentioned in your website, and there's multi-protocol. Bots that are not running on HTTP, they're running on UDP, NTP, they're running on TR69, they're running on frequently IoT-oriented amplification vectors. These are the three major IoT botnets, if you're not familiar with them. Mirai has got celebrity status. Hajime, nobody knows, but it's among one of the biggest IoT botnets in the world. It has, at last count, at least 300,000 devices under its control actively every hour. It's never launched an attack, so they call it the good. I don't know why they call it the good, but they call it the good. It, but it owns these devices, controls these devices. And BrickerBot. BrickerBot is an amazing bot who's designed to brick devices. And according to the BrickerBot author, it feels that he suggests that they bricked over 600,000 devices, killed IoT devices. S IoT are things like cable modems for service providers. They have had three service providers had to replace their entire cable modems, according <coughs> to BrickerBot and news reports. So this is what bots can do. This is what's bots that are on your website. This is the bot problem, data theft, web scraping, brute force, and so forth. These are the problems that you have to deal with in automation, is you have to deal with bots. You really have to get very good at bot management. It's your imperative going forward. Human management was the past and continues. Bot management, along with human management on security, is the future. So now let's talk a little bit about protecting yourself from automated social engineering, or something that's called, let's see if here I forget the slide, oops. It's called automated social engineering, or ACE. Anybody hear of this? So this is the idea that it's hard to do social engineering, right? It's not easy. It's especially the, the more focused it is, like spear phishing, the harder it is. That's just the way it is. So how do I make an effective social engineering campaign more fruitful? I automate it, right? So what are some examples of this? An example is Snapper. Here's a great example of automating social engineering. Snapper is a tool that's used on Twitter to spearfish. It's an automated tool. And it's so good that a Forbes, and you can, you, can, you can take a look at this yourself on a Google, a Forbes author actually took Snapper to the challenge that the Forbes author conducted a test to see if he could spearfish better than Snapper. And what you found was when he competed against the machine in two hours, that Snapper had 275 victims, completely automated, with the same parameters, and he had a very impressive 49 victims. I mean, 49 victims over two hours is nothing to, to shake a stick at. But you can see the value proposition that's different here, right? The thing is, to the people that were being infected, they saw no difference. They didn't know it was an automated tool. The tool is so good at what, they did, at, at what it did. In addition, in trying to figure out who is human and who is not human, the tool that we normally run to is CAPTCHA, right? You got to go press your boxes and so forth, put in the numbers that they show you to prove that you're a human. Does everybody understand that CAPTCHA has been fundamentally mortally wounded? There is no CAPTCHA in the world that can't be solved by automation, by a tool. The whole point in CAPTCHA is to be able to distinguish whether or not you're a bot or a human, and we know that there are bots that can break CAPTCHA frequently do, right? So CAPTCHA doesn't work any longer. The only reason we have CAPTCHA, do you want to know the reason why we have CAPTCHA? There's two reasons. First and fundamentally, have you ever noticed when you do CAPTCHA, it's always a driving scenario? It's like pick the signs, show me the dog, is this a storefront, how many of these are cars, 
How many of those have red lights? Have you noticed that? Has anybody noticed that? Have you ever wondered why they're not asking you to pick the orange between and the fruit bowl or something like that? Do you know why? It's what? Learning it's learning. For what? For, it's learning from us for why? It's all Google. Every bot management company, including ours, uses Google Captcha. And what is Google doing? They're, they're doing autonomous driving. You're teaching their cars for free, by the way, as part of CAPTCHA, what you think a sign looks like, a storefront looks like, and so forth. Really, the reason why Google really does such a good job at this is because you're training their deep learning engine for free on what you think is the correct thing to do so that their cars will anticipate what you think they're seeing. You understand that? The second reason why it exists is because people feel more comfortable with it, even though it doesn't work, right? That's the truth. In fact, Akamai, when they released, when they released their most current version two years ago of their bot management, they got rid of CAPTCHA, and many security managers got nervous about it and was told that they had to put it back in again. It looks like I'm low on time. I know we started a little late, so I'm going to do the AI versus AI very quick. One thing that Elon Musk, S Stephen Hawking, Vladimir Putin, and uh, who is it, the guy from Microsoft, Bill Gates, all have in common. They're all having something in common. And they believe that AI is and AI resources and AI concepts are the way that the next world struggle will take place. Ah, I got the police coming after me. All right, so here's the point on this slide. I was told I had more time. <laughs> I will say this, um, this conference has the best police. So I, I have these uh, slides for... An extra four minutes. Four minutes. But you guys can stay here with me. I really would appreciate it. <laughs> okay, if you're not familiar with deep learning and AI, here's the point on this. AI can be defeated. You see these stop signs? You see the pieces of tape on them? What do you think that does to AI? It causes the car that's looking at it, it's in an autonomous mode, to view a stop sign as a 45 mile per hour this is, the fir this is only the second time I've ever had this in my life. And uh, 45 mile per hour s um, s speed limit sign. This is called defeating algorithms and, and, uh, and learning. <laughs> this is what you have to protect in the future. I thank you very, very much for the, for the time today.